Thank you very much. My, my Japanese experience uh, has me in good stead because it feels like I'm doing karaoke at the moment. Um, to start off with an, a second joke, so as a measure of, of actually how, how I think influential that risky business report came, uh, became, when you Googled risky business for a time just shortly after it was released, it was the second result on Google after the video of Tom Cruise in his underwear <laughs> from YouTube. So I feel that was a, a big measure of success. So as Sunshine said, so first of all, it's, it's incredible to be here. This is exactly the kind of thing which I, I the, the Metcalf Fellows is a, um, speaking to journalists and, and communicating on the research that I'm doing is exactly the kind of thing that I place high priority on in my academic career. Um, so this is just a fantastic opportunity and thank you to everyone for coming. Um, to, to explain a little bit more, just a very brief, briefly about my background, the applied economic techniques means statistics, basically. I'm, I'm trained as an economist and a climate scientist uh, at the same time. And so most of my work fits in at the intersection of those two things. It doesn't seem like, um, that doesn't sound very difficult when I say it, oh, I work on climate and economics. It turns out that because of the way these two fields have developed independently of each other, it's actually very hard to start communication happening between those two. Um, so this work is really the culmination of, of years of a few different climate scientists, economists, people trained in, in both or between the two, um, of trying to find a way to collaborate with each other on what I think is one of the most important policy questions of the 21st century, which is climate change. And to try and do it in a way which presents the results in an actionable way. So something that we can actually try and think about policy uh, based off this, something that is really relevant to the way we make decisions as a society, as individuals, um, as public entities, but in a local sense. So that's really what guided us as we started doing this research, and now we have this, this body called the Climate Impact Lab, um, which is spread across a few different institutions, and we continue to work on this. We've expanded beyond the US to look globally, um, but here I'm gonna talk mostly about the impacts on the US economy. Um, Okay, so that's me. So, just to dive right in, climate change impacts on the economy are really usually talked about at national, global scale, something which is, I'm not gonna say irrelevant to people, but something which people can't really connect with. And that's something that we wanted to try and address with this research, to do it in a disaggregated way, to look locally, to look at different outcomes, not just say, here's the damage the, to the economy as a whole, but here's what the damage is to labor productivity or to coastal property or to any number of different sectors to really try and give people something to understand the, the implications of what this um, of what the the economic impacts will be um, I'm going to talk about some of those and go through some of the the results from mostly drawn from a paper that we published last year last summer um, we set out at the start to try and do the best science and economics possible to not cut corners in any way and so one of the the, the, the big goals was to make sure that every piece of this analysis is clear from start to finish. There's an awful lot of research about economic impacts of climate change, which feels like it's within a black box. It feels like something that we don't quite understand why 25% of the world's GDP is going to disappear. There's a lot of assumptions that go into that. We really try, try to set out to make sure that it's very clear from the start how our assumptions lead to our conclusions and make sure we test everything. So I think that's a big philosophy behind what we're doing. Um, the other philosophy is that we want this, as I said, to be usable and useful for people. Um, so always thinking about why we're doing this research, not just is it an intellectually interesting question. Um, so first of all, just to give us a picture of climate change. So I'm gonna use a lot of jargon during this. I might use the phrase RCP, which you've probably all heard, the representative concentration pathway. This is basically the emissions scenario. So how much CO2 the world is going to emit. There's four of these that are considered by, by the climate science community. Um, the numbers at the moment aren't super important. Um, we're gonna focus on two or three of these. So this is, in the blue, is historical emissions, and these are what the projections are. So this RCP 8.5, which I might call, refer to, even though it's not really, um, as a business as usual scenario, but that's kind of the emissions track that we're, we've been on for the past couple of decades. There's these media mitigation scenario, the RCP 4.5, um, which is if we adhere to our Paris Accord commitments as a world, we'll come in somewhere closer to that. 
And then there's this high mitigation scenario called RCP 2.6, which means that we really stop emitting carbon very soon and we get to net zero emissions, which seems very unrealistic in the world that we're living in now, but it's a scenario that we consider. So that's global climate change or the emissions. What does that look like for the US in terms of temperatures? So now just focusing on these three scenarios, we have our historical temperatures. I'm, I'm from Ireland, so I think in Celsius, but I put Fahrenheit up here just to be, to be kind. Um, here's what the continental United States average surface temperature, annual temperature, is going to look like under these different scenarios. So if we're looking at this low mitigation, so this one where we keep emitting the business as usual type scenario, this is a pretty significant change in average surface temperature. We're talking about something that's up at about eight, between eight and 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Mitigation is gonna get us a long way away from that, but there's still definitely gonna be some kind of temperature increase because of the way emissions uh, accumulate in the atmosphere. So now that's the US national scale. So what do we do? How do we ac estimate these economic damages? So the main point of departure from what's happened before for our research is that we want to base our damage estimates on the best empirical evidence possible. So really there's a foundation always in data. So this is the, the applied ec uh, economic techniques. We're basically doing statistics. On the other side, we have a lot of conversations with climate scientists in our team about, well, what, what can the climate science say? But make sure we tailor it to what we've learned from the economics about how people and economies respond. So we're doing some, some unique transformations of the climate data to make it relevant for the, for the economics. I can talk about that at any point afterwards if you want. We combine these two into some probabilistic trajectory for each county in the United States. So what I mean by that is we're not just looking at what we think the average change is going to be. We want to know what the tail risk is. We want to know what the 5% the extreme warming scenario is. That's, that's information that we think people need to make decisions, the type of decisions about risk that we make every single day in our lives when we think about buying insurance, when we think about investing in, in mortgages and, and our homes and our kids, that kind of stuff. The, the decisions about risk, which are very natural to us, but haven't so far been part of the conversation about climate change. Um, then we can aggregate this up to different states, to the, to the national economy and other things. So, as I said, we wanted to do this in a way that was broken down by different outcomes of interest. We don't want to just say, here's what happens to the US economy as a whole. We want to say what happens to different aspects of it, and then sum up from those. Because if I'm, a, if I'm thinking about health policy, I don't really care what happens to US GDP. I care what happens to people's health in a specific location. So this is about trying to make sure that we have local information divided up by sectors in a way which makes sense. So it's a little bit small to see, but basically we include, so our, our scope of coverage here, it's for the US, and we include a different outcomes, which are health, but think about mortality in particular, labor productivity, coastal property damages, um, crime rates, energy use, and agriculture. We limit ourselves to those ones for two reasons. One, because as I said, we needed to make sure that this was all based on the best empirical evidence drawn from data possible. And there's many different outcomes which we just don't have that evidence on, let alone, we probably don't even have the data on some of them. There's some others which we know are gonna be very important, where there isn't very good empirical evidence, like what is sea level rise gonna do? That's a difficult question to ask and a difficult question to answer because we don't know what the world looks like under one meter higher sea levels. We don't know what's going to happen to properties. We don't know if people are going to invest in protecting their homes, move away from the coasts. We haven't observed that in the historical record. So how do we understand what that relationship is? That's the point where we need to develop some models. But we know that it's important enough that we wanted to develop that model to include in here. So how we chose these sectors were the ones for which the evidence was best and the ones for which we thought they were the biggest uh, potential impacts. There's some enormous impacts that we had to leave off. So thinking about ecosystem services, water availability, some other things which are definitely not part of this. So you can think about what we have here as kind of a lower bound. Extra costs are going to make this inflate a bit. Okay. So I showed you US average climate. People don't live at the average. 
So we wanted to make sure we downscale this so we can see what happens to different parts of the, of the country. So this is what the historical summer temperatures are. And this is historical summer, sorry, historical winter temperatures. This is for, as I said, historical 1981 to 2010. So this is kind of the climate that we have now that we've all experienced. This is what happens to the, the temperature at each of these counties as we go forward through time. So 2020 to 2039, 2040 to 2059, and 2080 to 2099, at the end of the century. You can see the country is starting to get much hotter in the summers. As I said, we don't just care about the average here, we also care about the tail risk. Here's the one in 20 chance of warming. And we're talking about places that have average summer temperatures of about 110 degrees Fahrenheit um, in large parts of the southern United States. So some of these changes are extreme, and there's a definite 5% you know, risk of that happening. Similar pattern for winter's warming. This is just showing that humidity is also increasing. Rather than explain this, I'll just jump through to Again, making this a little bit more relevant to what we're experiencing. Again, thinking about the social impact of these changes as opposed to just the physical environment changing. So this is a figure which shows, historically, the state's average summer temperatures. So you can find your acronym, your favorite acronym of your favorite state. Rhode Island is, I think, here. It's about a 69 degree average, 69 degree Fahrenheit average summer temperature. Here's what this is going to look like under the median projection for this business as usual scenario, Rhode Island ends up here at about 78. So it's basically as hot as DC or almost as hot as Arizona is now. So there's some significant changes that are gonna happen. This is what happens for humidity. As you can see, Rhode Island is down here. This is the number of dangerously humid days. As it warms under this business as usual scenario, I think it's somewhere in this cloud, though I can't quite pick it out now. Um, but it basically ends up as humid as Louisiana is now. And that's what the physical climate projections are saying. So what's the economic implications of that at a local level? We also know that sea level rise is going to be a big impact. So we want to make sure that we have um, not just information about the sea level on average, but where it's different from, dip from location to location. So we have these local sea level rise projections. And that basically takes care of the physical climate aspect. So we have these local temperature changes, local sea level rise, local humidity changes. Now how do we do the economics part? So the first thing we do is we collect data. We collect a lot of data. We want to estimate these historical relationships. And then we do a bunch of statistics on it. We want to find a model that relates, for example, that identifies the relationship between heat and mortality. To do that, we look at how, a, how mortality changes within a county as a function of temperature. So in a really hot year, we see excess mortality. In a really cold year, we see less mortality. So we kind of use this as a treatment and control type of setup and look within the county to see how much temperature is moving mortality around. This isn't just mortality that comes from heat stress. This is often it's older people with, with compromised immune systems or some kind of cardiovascular stress, and this adds an extra pressure. So in this statistical model, we're picking up all of that stuff that might not be directly attributable to heat stress or heat stroke in a way that we would have seen before. We also want to collect evidence from as much other research as possible. This is not just about us and what we're doing. We're trying to represent a field of a 1,000 or so researchers who are working on this problem and incorporate that as much as we can. And as I said, some places where that evidence doesn't exist, we need to develop some computational models. The sea level rise is one piece of that. Something about energy supply was another piece of that. Um, and then we combine them all and we end up projecting out into the future. Combine this with these future climate projections. So what do we actually find? What does this statistics look like? Let's just give the example of agriculture here. So this is basically what my whole job is. My whole life is just tr making these figures and trying to find out what angle that line is at. Um, I spent 10 years trying to do just this. So what this says is, this is the percent change in an agricultural yield, this, in this case for maize, as temperature increases. But what this means is for a day, 
at this temperature, at any temperature here, compared to an average day, what's the difference in the yield at the end of the year? So you plant your crop, you observe days of different temperature, and then you say what the yield is. So if we were to move a day from here, about 25 degrees Celsius, which is about 70, 72, 73 Fahrenheit, and move it up here to 35, which is about 90 Fahrenheit, the yield would drop just for that one day change by about 5% at the end of the season. And that's the relationship that currently exists in the data. And that's within the US, a place which is very well adapted to climate, to its current weather shocks. So this should start to, to, you should start to pick out this information about the extremes. So if we're changing and shifting more days out to these extreme temperatures, we're gonna start seeing more, more impacts. We call these, um, we call these dose response relationships, borrowing some terms from, from medical literature. Um, but basically, the dose here is a temperature, and the response is what happens to yield or what happens to any of these outcomes we're thinking of. And so we're seeing some potentially big changes as the extremes shift because we have these nonlinear behaviors. There's a certain threshold here above which it starts to get really bad for crops. The same is actually true for health. The same is true for labor productivity. The same is true for a lot of things. So that's basically the, the evidence that we're basing this on. And that's developed with a statistical model that has 60 years of agricultural yields for a bunch of different crops for every county in the United States. And this is what it looks like when you map it. If we project this out into the future, to the end of the century, I'm going to go into more detail of, of what these results show later, but just to show you in advance, if we take the temperature changes that I showed you already, just in the, the median, the average change case, Here's what looks like, here's what uh, agricultural impact, impacts look like across the United States. So you can see this big divide between the kind of more irrigated Western United States and the less irrigated Eastern United States and some pretty significant crop declines here. Up to, you know, 50% declines in yields. To, to pull out this, in, this information about extremes a little bit more, so that was the average change here. But as I said, we've got these temperatures that go right up to this tail risk, this one in 20 chance of extreme temperature change. So what does the full distribution look like here? If we look nationally speaking, aggregate across the whole economy, let's just dive into one of these. So this is for the business as usual scenario. And this is for the close, you know, the next 20 year period. 20 years in the middle of the century, 20 years at the end of the century. And here's what the distribution, so the, all the possibilities of yield declines look like. And so you can see on average, this is a kind of 2% decrease. But down here where this line is, it means there's a 1 in 20, 20 chance in the next 20 years of a 10% decrease in crop yields. If we go further out, we see that this tail, this 1 in 20 chance, is down to, as I said, about 50% decrease nationally across the country for maize. So thinking about these extremes, not just thinking about this, this median here, a 15% decrease in crop yields is, is pretty bad, but knowing that there's a, a one in three chance of getting down to 40, or maybe I got that wrong, a one in 20 chance of getting down to 55, this is a kind of risk that we have to think about when we make climate policy, when we think about the economic implications of this. Okay. Another way to think about these extremes is, is in thinking of the return interval. So we all know the, the concept of like a hundred year flood. So that's a flood that's so extreme that the, the level of flood that happens only once every hundred years. So let's imagine that for, for agriculture, for an agricultural loss. Let's think of a one in 20 year event now. So a one in 20 year heat wave or drought, which leads to a large crop loss that we'd only see once every 20 years. So we're definitely thinking about the tail events here, the extreme events. That's represented by this blue line. That's one event happens every 20 years. Under these different warming scenarios, let's just focus on the RCP 8.5, the business as usual one. As we go forward in time, here's how many of these 
current one in 20 years event, events, we will start to see every 20 years. It's a little bit counterintuitive to think of. So currently the one in 20 year event, if we take the magnitude of that event and see how frequently it occurs in each 20 year period into the future, you start to see that this one in 20 year event starts happening once every 10 years in the next decade or so, once every five years by the middle of the century, and almost happening once every year, once every two years by the end of the century. So this extreme event, which we currently think could only happen once every couple of decades, by the end of the century, we're pushing it so that it's gonna be happening once every two years or so. Okay, let's talk about sea level rise for a little bit. So we had, as I said, our local projections. So this is what sea level rise looks like. You can see more sea level rise occurring here in the, in the Gulf, a little bit more in the Northeast, lower sea level rise happening in the Pacific Northwest. There's all kinds of interesting reasons why that's happening. The surface of the crust is rebounding after the Ice Age, so the land is rising in some cases, and in some cases, tidal basins are changing, all kinds of interesting things that are happening in the dynamics of the ocean there. So this is not something that we experience. We experience, it is a global impact, but we experience it definitely differently in, um, in each different location. So picking out one of those locations, I'll pick out two of them. Um, this is what the 100 year floodplain looks like in Miami. And this is what the change in this, her, this 100 year floodplain is. So Miami kind of goes under here. You can see the coastal part down here. And the 100 year floodplain in blue is where it is currently. As we go into the future, as sea levels start to rise, you can see that it starts to increase more and encroach. So that by the end of the century, it's, it's increased its, its uh, inroads into Miami. This is keeping, so there's, there's a couple of things which determine what's happening here. One is sea level rise. But a lot of these floods are driven by storm surges and storm activity. So for this projection, we're keeping the current storms as fixed. Saying, okay, the hurricane activity is not gonna change. We know that for the Atlantic basin, the intensity is probably going to increase, even if the frequency stays the same. So we're gonna get bigger storms, and Miami is definitely gonna be susceptible to hurricanes. So what happens if we look at the, the climate change projection on storm activity? So we combine sea level rise and storms, so now we've got extra hurricanes in here, or extra strong hurricanes. This is what happens to that floodplain by the end of the century. So no surprise, I feel like I'm, I'm repeating myself. Things look like they're getting worse. That's not true across the country, um, and we'll see that as we get to some of the other results. We'll look at the same thing for New York. New York with historical storm activity. This is what the floodplains are like throughout the century. Here's New York with, with changes to hurricane intensity. <coughs> this is just showing kind of what's happening with historical storms in a few different states and how increasing the, the like going out more into the tail of what sea level rise might do is increasing those damages a lot. Okay. I've told you about a lot of bad things that are happening so far. I'm gonna take an aside for a moment and think about something else. So this is from a, another piece of research that I've done, um, which actually the, the, the Puerto Rican government were looking at very carefully in the past year because of what happened there with Hurricane Maria. So it's a little bit of a, of a tangent. What happened here was, what this research shows, is that if we have a country growing at a certain rate and it get hit, gets hit by a hurricane, Instead of growing at that rate that it would have, it starts to grow along one of these curves. And so its growth slows down for up to two dec decades afterwards. And there's no evidence that it recovers. So this was kind of a new and surprising finding, particularly for a lot of economists who believe that hurricanes come in and it blows away all the old rundown factories and everything which is making our economy drag and you build back these new factories and everything's fantastic. Uh, it turns out that's not the case. So I bring this up now just to frame a few of the results that we're, I'm going to show later. So one of the things which we're doing is we're showing what the direct impacts are in each location. 
from, from different climate change impacts. But the point that this is, or I'm trying to, to, to use this to show, is that we actually live in this very interconnected economy, both nationally and globally. So if we think about Hurricane Harvey, or if we think about other extreme events, what happened in Hurricane Harvey, even though it's a big effect in Texas, and we see the human cost in Texas most of all, the money for rebuilding that was coming from federal sources. So that is an effect which happens to the national economy. So this is the same of sea level rise. If you think that sea level rise is not a problem in, in large parts of the country inland, the more that we see those risks increase along the coast, the more that this gets put onto the, this is a, a price tag for the national economy because we are all interconnected. For some of the results I'm gonna show you afterwards, we don't, we're not able to estimate what this interconnectedness is or how big this effect would be because it's an extremely difficult problem. Um, but just to keep in mind that definitely if we think, okay, Miami or Louisiana or Florida or Louisiana or Texas are going to be the worst affected places because they've got storms, they've got sea level rise, they've got excess heat, they've got all of these terrible things happening. Other parts of the country that look, might look much better are not immune from that because it's not just the physical system that we're thinking about, it's this interconnected economic system. So just to frame these results a little bit. Okay, so back to climate damages. As I said, my whole life is, is estimating what goes behind these figures. Um, here's the effects for some different of the sectors we looked at. I'm gonna dive into these ones a little bit more when I show you the results. But in our estimates for, in general, we have 26 of these different things. Relationships between crop yields and temperature and precipitation and between health and temperature precipitation, as many of these different things as we can identify. And we map these out for what the impacts are going to look like throughout the century for all these different scenarios. So what I'm showing you here is, again, just that end of century, business as usual type of scenario for a set of different sectors. So this is agricultural yields, which you saw before. This is for what we call low risk labor. So labor, people working indoors. So it's basically everything except for manufacturing, farming, and mining. Here's what happens to violent crime. Here's what happens to mortality. Here's what happens to high-risk labor. So this is the agriculture, mining, and, and manufacturing. And here's what happens to property crimes. So very robust relationships between those things in the historical data. And we look at what happens to them in the future. So you'll probably start to notice some patterns. I'll draw your eye to this mortality one. So anything that's blue is a decrease in mortality. Anything that's red is an increase in mortality. So you should start to see that as opposed to some, some um, statements about climate change being this terrible thing for everybody in the world, you start to see that actually, even within the US, there's people who benefit and people who lose. The question then is to the US national economy, what happens on net? And this should maybe start to, to activate another light bulb in your head. What does this mean for equality across the country? So we'll see that in a little bit. So the reason that we have these different distributions across the country is because we have these nonlinear impacts. So this is mortality. We see that the mortality rate increases for cold days. There's higher mortality on cold days and mortality rate increases for hot days. So there's higher mortality on hot days. So if you live in a currently cold place and you start to get warmer because of climate change, that looks like a good thing because there's fewer deaths from those cold days. If you live somewhere in the middle and climate change moves you out here, you might not notice that much of an effect. Some mortality will shift from the winter to the summer. If you live in a place where your temperatures are already here, frequently, and you're just moving out in this direction, things start to look much worse. The experiment that we as a global population are running with climate change is that we're turning the thermostat up, not down, and so you'll see more places moving out to here, and you see this exactly in the mortality projection data. Places which were colder in the north start to see declines in mortality. Places that were warmer in the south that were already at this threshold are starting to see increases. 
So we have this thing where there's both winners and losers because of the fact that we have this nonlinear change. The same is true for electricity demand. We heat our homes on cold days, we cool our homes on hot days. In the middle, if you live in, in California, in some parts of California, you don't do anything. It's perfect all the time, just in here. Um, that's not like most of the country. And so you see this same thing, where some places have decreased demand in energy, some places have increased demand. Very similar to what's happening in mortality. There's some places where nobody benefits. So for violent crime, there's this very strong relationship between days getting hotter and more violent crime. There's no non-linearity in that. It just means that the hotter it is, the more hot days we experience, the more violent crime that we'll experience on average. So the whole country just looks like it's getting worse in percentage terms. So that's where there's a linear response. For labor, temperature and labor, temperature doesn't affect your labor productivity at really at cold temperatures, but when we get to a certain temperature threshold, people just stop working. And they don't stop working completely. This is, this is estimated from data where we have exact minute by minute time use on millions of people across the US. And we find that they're taking about 30 or 40 minutes off on these really hot days. They're stopping work earlier. And so that looks like a very small effect for a one person. But when you multiply that by the fact that there's 180 million person labor force in the United States, that can end up being a big economic effect. OK. Some caveats here. I wouldn't be, uh, we were just had a discussion about how scientists always needed to uh, caution people about how to interpret their research and how to talk about uncertainty and other things. So some caveats here in interpreting these results. We're holding for this the US economy fixed at its 2012 values. So if there's migration of people, it's happening to the extent it was happening in 2012. If there's more agriculture in one place and more manufacturing in another, we kind of keep that fixed as we project out into the future. So if there's massive structural changes to the economy, we're not going to pick that up. So the way that we should interpret this is not thinking, not a, a prediction of what the future would be like, but really showing under different scenarios where are the current vulnerabilities in the US economy. So I'm not telling you that in 2100, if you live in some part of the Pacific Northwest, here's how much crime you'll be facing. I'm saying that the risk in that part of the country now, based on the economic structure, is what we find in our results. We also don't consider adaptation. The US, it seems, in other work that we've been doing, is pretty close to this frontier of adaptation. The US is one of the more adapted countries in the world, which is why it's surprising that we still will see effects. Um, but the reason for that is that it's expensive to adapt to things. The perfect way to adapt to, to make sure there's no health effects of temperature is to enclose ourselves in massive air-conditioned domes, and that's an expensive thing to do. We can air condition our homes, but we still have to leave at some point. Some people can't even afford to air condition their homes um, in places where they really should, and so they're experiencing the health effects. Adaptation is expensive, um, so even in the US, which is pretty close to being well adapted, there are still effects. Um, I've been showing most of the results for RCP 8.5. I would hope that we're gonna mitigate away some of that, but again, this is really to show you where the, the vulnerabilities are. Okay, so then we think about the whole economy. We've been looking at different parts of it. I said that there's some places that benefit, some places that lose, but what is the net effect on the US economy? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? So I'm gonna show you a bunch of these. You can kind of ignore what this is. This is just the circles represent uh, data points. These represent data that are coming out of our projections from different climate models. What we have here is when we sum up all of these, we place values on each of those impacts sum them up and calculate a percent of US GDP that's damaged because of climate change, we plot that against temperature increase, so the change in global surface temperature. So if this business as usual scenario gets us to about between four and five degrees Celsius, what would that mean for the US economy based on these six sectors that we looked at? So when we look at these high mitigation scenarios, the temperature doesn't get that hot, there's not that much damage, at most it looks like it's about 2% of GDP. We look at these medium scenarios, the one that we're probably just a little bit above, some of the, there's some probability of it getting up to about four degrees and damaging about 4% of, of US GDP. And we look at these very hot scenarios, it goes out way further. And so we can trace out 
what the damage is, damage is to the total US economy. So even though some parts in the north benefited, some parts in the south were harmed, on net, if we look across the whole economy, the economy is losing value because of this. So if you're sitting in the Pacific Northwest and you think I'm fine, the national economy is not going to be doing particularly well. And so it's something where you have to think about the situation of both the local and the national, and frankly, the global economy, um, and how those things are interrelated. So as I said, this would be about a four, between a four and five for this business as usual scenario. We're talking about somewhere between maybe three and 6% of GDP damaged each year by the end of the century. That might seem like a small amount, but in what I'm gonna show you, hopefully, um, it again depends on how we think about this. So this is where thinking about the people who are affected by this becomes an important thing to do. We're thinking about not just, let's frame it in this way, I think Massachusetts is, I think, 2% of the US economy. So a 2% loss is the same as either everybody loses 2% of their incomes out of their pockets, or the country as a whole loses Massachusetts entirely. The distribution of those damages is an important thing to consider because that's very different, um, they have very different implications for what we should do for policy. This is just showing how the sectors contribute. Most of this is coming from mortality. So what about the extremes? Those distribution curves I showed you earlier, this is what this looks like for mortality at the end of the century under this business as usual scenario. So the average change is somewhere around here, like 2% of GDP damage because of mortality. But we have possibilities for a lot of different outcomes. If we're thinking about the probability of exceeding a 5% loss of GDP, if we just look at mortality, it's about 8%. If we start to add in all these other sectors, that increases. So by the time we've summed all these up, there's close to a 20% chance that we could lose 5% of GDP in the US under this business as usual scenario. So again, in thinking about extremes, the tail risk here is significant and something that we should be thinking about for policy in the same way when we invest in anything or we buy insurance, we should be thinking about that. Here's what this looks like spatially. Again, this inequality pattern. The states in the south are on average poorer than the states in the north. So a way to see this more clearly is to break up each of those counties into deciles. So this is the poorest 10% of counties in the US. That's the richest 10% of counties in the US and everything in between. And look at the percent damage to their local incomes because of climate change. And what you can see is this pattern, like I had just said, the poorest counties lose a lot more of their GDP. This is something that, again, if we care about distribution, if we care about uh, inequality or the, the social outcomes of climate change, this should be something that scares most of us. This is saying that poor people get hit much harder than rich people as climate change uh, increases temperatures. So what it's going to do is, it's not only going to damage the national economy, it's going to make the distribution of incomes spread out more. It's going to increase inequality across the country. Okay, a little bit of an aside, much of this for the fellows, but for anyone who wants to look at this, part of why we did this was to make sure that we could share this local information. Our institution is making these maps for all of these outcomes um, so that you can go and click on your county and see what this looks like. You can look at the high probability events, the low probability events, see what that tail risk is like from these extremes, and look at this for you know, coastal damages in some places. We're also doing this for the world. And so we have all of these. We're trying to make sure that people have information that will be actionable here. And then just in the, I guess, last minute that I have, just to give you some stylized facts about what we found. So just to generally categorize things, basically, future summers in, in California, Ohio, uh, New Jersey, Rhode Island as well. Um, we're about the same as the current summers in Texas and Florida and Louisiana. These are big changes that we're talking about. There is, when thinking about those agricultural results, 
a one in four chance of almost continuous Dust Bowl-like conditions of just persistent drought and crop damage to the extent that we saw in the Dust Bowl. There's a one in two chance that the mortality impact that we see will be equivalent to the vehicle mortality right now. Vehic vehicular mortality is one of the largest causes of death in this country for people who are largest, um, for people who are in their like middle ages and younger. It's one of the leading causes of death. It's something that we make an enormous amount of policies about. Everyone buys insurance for their car. We have to wear seat belts. There's an enormous amount of rules and regulations about reducing that risk and reducing the externality. For something that is going to be the same order of magnitude, we make very few policies. Hurricane losses, I didn't get a chance to show this, but hurricane losses, this is kind of related to that research I showed where I mentioned Puerto Rico, hurricane losses in the long term are 10 times larger than direct damages. Basically, the shock to a local economy, the things that we lose that we count up as damages, that knocks on into our economy for the next decade or two decades, and it's 10 times larger by the time that we observe it two decades later. Mortality and labor impacts were the largest costs. The cost of crime was similar to the cost of agriculture. So agriculture here was, it's gotten a lot of research attention, but it's much smaller as an impact than some of the other things that we're talking about. And then this inequality story, which I tried to highlight, that these nonlinear responses, the fact that some people gain and some people lose out, means that the South and the Midwest are gonna be much worse hit than some other places. This is definitely a, a regressive transfer, as we would say in economics. This is effectively like putting a very heavy tax burden on the poor and taking away all the tax burden from the rich. And that's what climate change kind of looks like in an economic sense. And I think that's my time. Hi, thanks, that was really fascinating. I have two questions, one's simple, and um, I hope I can ask both. Uh, which, how do you value, what is the value of a life that, that gives the mortality figure? Okay, so I'm, I'm not one of these people who can store questions in my mind and answer a string of them, so I'll answer them yes. directly so I don't forget. Um, what we use for this, because we're thinking of the we're thinking of the regulator or the, the policy maker or a business or somebody who's thinking about this problem. We use what the US government recommends as the value of a life. The way that you estimate that, so that the Environmental Protection Agency has this number of about, I think it was $7.9 million in 2012 dollars. So that's up to eight point something now for a specific life. If you, there's a few ways you can think of estimating this. Um, if you just look at the, uh, kind of accounting value. So if we just look at the costs, like lost wages, or the amount that you spend on funerals, or transfers that happen to other family members, this is a very small number um, on the order of you know $100,000. But I think a lot more people, uh, people will spend a lot more to try and avoid dying. And so the way that you, you look at this in terms of research is you look at the amount that people are willing to invest in life insurance, in uh, not driving above the speed limit in things that they know increase their probability of death and back out this value from that. So really it's, it's showing what people of a certain wealth level are willing to invest to avoid dying. And that's how you find that value. Okay. Thanks, can I ask one more? Okay, so um, something that's always confused me in economics and I wonder if you can um, help me understand it is that people will think about investment in like recovering from a storm or in fighting a war, and they always say this for World War II brought us out of the um, economic slump as being a stimulus, and like we, like what we did in 2008, so that there's like a Keynesian effect, and then you stimulate the economy, and it's a net positive. So how does that factor in when you have a destruction, then you rebuild, and then you put stim you stimulate the economy that way? Does that factor into any of this? So in the case of a war, th there's, there's a bunch of research showing that places recover very, qu not quickly, but places can recover back to what they how they were growing before wars. One of the reasons why I think that's different than disasters or environmental uh, impacts is because there is a, an expectation that, after World War II, there's an expectation in Germany or Japan that 
World War II is, World War III is not going to break out like in the next year, that there will be peace for a while and then investments there will be allowed to, to grow and develop unhindered by another massive economic shock. In places that have infrequent disasters, the same could be said to be true. But even when you're thinking about something like the rebuilding of, of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, you see that some parts of it looked like they were doing well. Some parts, like the Lower Ninth, which were worst hit, don't seem to have recovered at all. Lots of small businesses have closed down. And so you see this shift away. So there's economic changes which can occur, and maybe they're obscured by this, this overall stimulus type of idea. For this other research that I showed of this long-run decline, it's in thinking about, so it's in what economics we'd call the counterfactual. If we have a hurricane come in and destroy a bunch of old factories and we build some new ones and they're more productive, and you measure only there, you compare these two factories, you say, okay, we're more productive, this looks good. But what you're not thinking of is the counterfactual, the thing which would have happened if there was no hurricane. In the case where there was no hurricane, we could have had the old factory and built a new factory, and so we would have had more productivity. What the hurricane or the natural disaster do will probably focus investments in a certain area, but that money is being drawn from other areas. So we're not making investments that we would have made otherwise if we were more adapted, if our infrastructure was better able to cope, that kind of stuff. Um, so I have a question. Um, you sh when you showed the graph of um, mortality increasing in the south and decreasing in the north due to temperature fluctuation, or the temperature difference getting hotter in the south and, and warmer in the north, um, when you think about, you know, if it gets too hot somewhere to live, most, like, animals move to a somewhere that's more tolerable, right? And people, you would also think, like, people would also want to move north because those places are more tolerable temperature-wise, but how does, like, how would that affect, like, the economy? And furthermore, like, how would people who can afford to move affect the economy versus people who can't afford to move affect the economy? So it's a great question, and it's something that, to be honest, I don't know the answer to, and it's definitely a f one of the most frontier areas of research in the economics of climate change. Um, your, last, your last point there, I think, was, was very important um, of who gets to move. Mm -hmm. So we see that more, uh, migration, internal migration in the US is declining. One of the biggest migration trends is actually opposite to what you would expect from this. It's people moving from cold areas to hot areas. You can do that, like Houston can be the f one of the fastest growing cities in the country because air conditioning exists and because people have the resources to move in there, um, pay for that air conditioning and live in a, in a comfortable environment. So the, the switch to that, the thing which you might think would happen there, they'd move to more, more uh, cooler environments, hasn't happened yet. So there is still, investment in economic investment in places which are most exposed to climate risk. Um, so it's a case where the economy is dominating what the environmental signal is. And it's completely unclear if that will switch or not. There's some fascinating research that came out recently showing that um, asylum seeker applications in Europe are robustly linked to high temperatures in the location where people, uh, people's origins. So maybe this is something that only happens for people who are subsistence farmers, for example. So it might not be as big of a factor in the US. Um, but the, the implications for this type of research, I think, hinge entirely on your last point, which is what might happen is, if it does become something that we notice as a risk that we want to escape from, who will be able to move? The same way who can afford air conditioning, who can afford flood insurance, that kind of stuff. Who can afford to move, and when can they afford to move? And what happens to the people who remain behind? Um, it's a big open question, but I think one of the more important ones that, that is related to this research. So uh, this is pretty shocking to the people sitting here, and we're interested. How is it affecting policy, and who's listening? This specifically, how is it affecting policy, or the whole... <laughs> <laughs> it's It's well known that it's not a very good, I, I might go on to a soapbox for a moment, so thank you for that question. It's, it's well known that the policy environment isn't really uh, conducive or friendly towards people who do the type of research that I do at the moment, but it's part of a broader trend which I think is incredibly worrying, 
which is an overall um, dismissal of the role of, I'm not even gonna say experts, because I would, wouldn't want to talk about that, but a dismissal of um, evidence-based knowledge. In fact, for the CDC, I think there was a policy saying that the phrase evidence-based could not be used in any of their documents. So there's this war on knowledge which is happening in this country at the moment, which is an extremely worrying trend. The rational thing to do here, what, what I would love to happen is to say, okay, this is a risk and it's on the order of many things we make policies about that we care about. I would love for climate change to be as boring as the sewer systems. Where if we got rid of all of the sewer systems and we didn't pay our taxes to make sure we had clean water, everyone would have cholera and people would be dying of diarrheal diseases, but that doesn't happen anymore. I would love for climate change to be the same, where it's just some small levy that happens and then we don't have to face these risks. It hasn't gotten to that stage yet. It's too politically contentious for various reasons. Um, so at the moment, it looks like a pretty depressing picture. But there is still an enormous number of people working on this issue, and there's still people listening. So I know from, from our research, this paper, particularly that figure showing the inequality, resonated quite heavily with people. And it got a lot of attention from people in the press because of that. I don't think that's because our paper was brilliant. I think people were thinking about inequality and thinking about the environment, and this put those two things side by side. And they said, oh, now these two issues that we think are large issues, we show that they're actually related. Um, so there was a large response from the public. The, within the US, there's also a lot of interest from the people who care about climate change in a policy setting. So this US Climate Alliance, which is a group of states and, and, and municipalities who are trying to adhere to the Paris Accord, um, they have started a partnership with us. So this is a thing where if we can weather this storm of funding being taken away and of hostility towards our research, that there are still people who are interested in this. It's small comfort, it feels, at times, um, but it's definitely a, a source of optimism, at least. Yeah, and the caveat you gave, one of the caveats you gave was that um, the numbers you present are based on uh, virtually no change structurally. Uh, and yet in the next 30 years, we'll probably see um, societal changes that'll be 100 to 1,000 times as much as they were in the past due to technological changes. And then in the next 60 years, it'll probably be 100,000 to a million times as much. And that's got to have an enormous change on, on the structure of society. Self-driving cars, for example, we're not going to be driving cars 50 years from now, and that's going to have an enormous societal uh, impact, and that's just one small area. So how do you try to deal with, with that? So part of it is we're, we're dealing with it empirically going forward as we do this global stuff. We're looking at the effects of income increases on technology adoption and other things to see how much that decreases the impacts. It turns out it decreases them by quite a lot, not in the US, because the US is quite close to that frontier of being adapted. The, not that I'm a technological pessimist, but the idea that we will innovate our way out of all of these problems, I think is, um, I wouldn't say misguided, but it's definitely not something we should rely on as being the solution. There are a set number of technologies. So for example, just thinking of agriculture, there's three things that crops do. They, they produce shoots, stems, and leaves, and seeds, basically. That's it, three things. And there is a, an extent to which they can maximize that. And for all the crops that we're growing at the moment, we've basically maximized all of those. We can shift around in different directions, but we're kind of at the technological frontier for food production. So that's for, for, for crop production in that way. That's a difficult thing to think that we can innovate our way out entirely from being susceptible on the environment. In, because in places where we are very non-susceptible to the environment, like US agriculture, you still see big impacts in the present day. So I'm not saying that like, there's no hope from technology, but I would say that technology is not going to solve this without some directed investment. And even with that, it's an open question of whether we can rely on those changes or, um, or not. The, the past hundred years has seen more changes in society than anything in the history of the planet. That doesn't mean the future will see those same changes. Someone who was born in around World War I has seen the population of the world double 
three times, that's completely unprecedented. We will not see that level of change in innovation speed again. And so the increases in technology will definitely have benefits, but the question of whether they are completely transformative or marginal, or whether they will outpace the things that we're seeing, to me, is enough of a risk that would imply we do something about this as well as investing in technology, as opposed to just ignoring this and thinking that technology will solve it all. So this is a risk, a definite risk calculation. If I was an actuary, I would say the, I would place some investments in trying to mitigate climate change because it's unclear whether a transformative technology will save everybody. And it's probably dangerous to rely on that. I hope it happens. Uh, for me, at least, this has been frightening, <laughs> to say the least. And I hope that you've learned something about Metcalf and what we do and how we do it. And as you go back and ponder these things, maybe you can come up with some suggestions that, of things that we could do to help us to uh, alleviate some of this. We're, we speak to a lot of people on a lot of days, and uh, hopefully they listen. So any advice you might give would, would be terrific. But and thank you very much. And I, I was, as we were saying in our discussion at lunch, uh, I don't think that's a one-way interaction. I think the, there's a lot of science which happens in a siloed vacuum um, of what you think is the interesting question, but it's not really connected to what the answers are people want to know. And I think that's why I've been so interested in the, the past few months as I've been looking through the Metcalf things and, and my my brief opportunity to talk to the fellows so far is to learn also what the important questions are from a science point of view, not just how to communicate the things that I think are important. Um, so it definitely goes in both ways. One last question from one of our fellows. Um, yeah, thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, I was uh, fascinated also by that uh, graph in um, um, I think I forget the color, but in any case, it, it uh, explained the cor it, um, explained the correlation between climate change and criminality, and it sounds like everywhere is going to get more violent. It was violent criminality specifically. Uh, so, how did you get that conclusion? So, there's a couple of so more caveats on that one is that there is this this secular trend, meaning that there's declines in violent crime. So, this is a percent increase off a trend. In some places, like Chicago, where I'm from, actually the trend has switched around and there's increases in crime, so then it looks a little bit more worrying. Um, but crime's at a lower level now than it definitely was in the, definitely at a lower level than it was in the 70s or 80s. Um, so this is a percent increase or percent change off that trend. Um, so it makes it a little bit hard to interpret because we also have to project what happens to, to uh, crime rates overall, which is a, almost an impossible task. Um, but we know what the percent change due to climate change will be costing. So that's part of, um, that's part of interpreting the results. How do we come to that conclusion? Uh, the same way that we do everything else in this statistical thing, we, we look at, we get as much data on crime rates as possible for as long as possible, for as many locations as possible. We get the data on temperatures in those locations down to the day or sometimes uh, less than a day. We look at what happens when you shift within a given location, so controlling for all of these unobservable differences that might exist between locations. We look within a location and see what happens when the day is marginally hotter versus marginally colder and what that does to the, to the crime rate. And we do this for millions of different crimes individually. Um, and then a pattern starts to emerge of this. It's not precise, there's some uncertainty around it, um, but it's different than zero, so it's statistically significant, we'd say. Um, but that's basically the, the methods that involves. It's been, maybe just to, to broaden that out a little bit, it's something which was pointed out by, by one of the fellows, the, the interest in the, of most national security apparatuses in climate and conflict is, is, is pretty high. Um, and partly that's because this relationship, whether the mechanism is through food declines or like agricultural impacts or something, the relationship between crime and conflict and temperature is actually quite robust and something that people increasingly see as a security risk. But 
when the US Army talked about it, they were thinking of increased water wars or drought-based driven conflict in, in poorer parts of the world. But this is also something which, is, which definitely has local effects. And it was, I mean, it's also mentioned in The Wire. There's a day which is particularly hot, and they say we need to send more people out because people are gonna, today's gonna be a bad day. So it's something that's known, and then it's statistically related. It's this local and global problem together, and um, probably drawing from some of the same mechanisms.